Okay, welcome everyone. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Macquarie University land, the Wollamatago land of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Um, I'd like to introduce Peter Gresta. It's a great honour to have him here today addressing our department. Um, as you all know, he's an academic, a filmmaker, a journalist, an author. It's a wonderful book we're talking about today. Um, he first came to academia in 2018 after a 30 year career as an award winning foreign correspondent for all the major international organisations, really, the BBC, Reuters, CNN, and of course, Al Jazeera. Um, and in some of the world's most dangerous places, as we discover in the book. It has won numerous awards, including the British Royal Television Society, the Wolfie Foundation, the RSL, the Australian Human Rights Commission, and the International Association of Press Clubs. Um, and the book today, it traces his time in the Egyptian prison after he was arrested in 2013 in Cairo on terrorism charges. Um, and of course, at a sham trial, he and his two Al Jazeera colleagues were accused of producing stories that were damaging to Egypt's national security. And national security is a theme we'll come back to in this talk, um, and as it relates to Australia. And he was released in 2015 after 400 days of detention, including a period in solitary confinement. Um, and it's great to have you here. Thanks very much, Bob. Yeah. So I'd like to just start with, journalists aren't meant to be the story, are they? Not news journalists, not non-partisan, partisan, objective journalists. So how hard was it to write this about yourself? It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, you know, if you're always told, you never use the first person when you're writing as a journalist. And so one of the things I really struggled with was to try and figure out how to write about myself in a way that was meaningful. Um, I was very self-conscious. I was self-conscious of the fact that I didn't feel like someone who had a lot of literary experience. Now, there are a lot of people who've been through far more harrowing, far more extreme prison experiences than I had. People who are people who are far better writers than I was. And I didn't feel comfortable in just telling my, my 400 days in hell. So what I really needed to do before I could actually start the thing was to find, was to figure out what the story meant. What I, why was I writing the book? What was it for? It just felt too self-indulgent to write about my 400 days of hell in Egypt. Excuse me. Um, and so it was, it, there was a long time, a long period of real agonizing. In the end, there are a couple of things I realized. First of all, that the story did have meaning in, in terms of the context. And when I saw, when I saw, when I thought about it, a lot had to do with one guy who I think was someone who was really key figure in the book and a really key figure. Um, in helping me survive prison was a guy called Allah Abdul Fattah, who is one of the most extraordinary um, activists, probably the most significant political prisoner that remains in Egypt today. He was a guy who is a remarkable secular pro-democracy activist. And he was not solely, but um, to a very large extent, the inspiration for a lot of young activists, from a lot of the pro-democracy activists who came onto the streets in 2011. Um, he's been imprisoned by every regime in Egypt from Bosnia to Barak on. And he was my, my neighbor. And for a long time, we'd have sort of whispered conversations through the bars. And eventually when I was allowed out, um, he, he you know, was released from solitary. He and I had a lot of long conversations. And he was the guy that really helped me understand the politics of what I was going through, why I was there for political reasons, because I initially saw it very personally. And when I was coming to write the book, I realized, thought a lot about what Allah told me about the politics of this, I started to see it more, not about 
the, the, the imprisonment not about anything we had done, but about what we've come to represent. And I saw that in context and realised that in all sorts of ways, the way the Egyptian government had come after us using loosely framed national security legislation to effectively silence uncomfortable journalism. And I realised that that was actually the story of journalism more broadly since 9-11. When I looked at my own my own history, I realised, and there's never, you know how these things go, there's never a neat narrative. Nature doesn't work in the beginnings, middles and end. But I could see how I could construct a story using the prison experience as to draw a parallel to sort of interrelate it with my own, interspersed with my own experience in the field over the years, starting in Afghanistan before 9-11. And tracing those key moments in my career where I could almost make the point about the way in which journalism would been come under would come under attack. And so those two stories, it's the, the, the longer story, the longer historical narrative of journalism being targeted in, in the war on terror. I am superimposed over my own story of what was happening to us in Egypt became all of a sudden there was a coherence to it and a reason for, the, for telling the story of what was taking what take place, what, what, what was being done to us in prison. Does that make sense? I'm not sure if I'm being particularly coherent. But when it came to writing it, I also started writing it in third person um, because it just felt so uncomfortable using the eye and the back and, and just changed the E to. to to, to me. <laughs> <laughs> but the structure works well because you alternate, don't you, the history and the political context yes. with your personal story in the jail. Yes. Um, yeah, and you, there's a, there is a difference in time between the two sections of the book. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, I wanted the, because what I did was, was I, the first chapter deals with that with um, our arrest. The second chapter goes back to Afghanistan in 1995, when I was a BBC correspondent in Kabul. And I, I, I used that because I needed to explain, I needed to find a way of talking about the way in which the, um, the world existed before 9-11, our relationship with Islamic extremists before 9-11. Because we've come, what 9-11 has done is created such a deeply embedded sense of the clash of civilization. It almost feels as though we've always been at war with Islam. In fact, we haven't. And I, I realized that 1995, I used to cross the front lines all the time um, in Afghanistan. And that was when the Taliban first emerged. We'd go and speak to the Taliban and have long, long theological discussions and debates with them. Um, they didn't always agree with what we were saying who we were, our, our theology, but it didn't really matter to them. They weren't fighting this kind of, we weren't, we weren't at war with them. It wasn't a conflict between the West and Islam. And that was to come later. And so I wanted to lay that down as a kind of baseline for how things once were before 9-11. And so once I've done that, I then, I then go back to Egypt and talk a little bit more about the interrogation phase, what, what had happened during the interrogation, and then go back to Egypt, go back to sorry, Afghanistan again, post 9 11, when I went back after the, after the attacks during the, the, the war to oust the Taliban, and then back to Egypt and so on. Um, and I needed to find a way of writing. I wanted to write, um, I put the prison chapters in present tense and the historic chapters in past tense, because I wanted those historical chapters to feel more like essays, um, more like journal, long form journalistic essays. And I wanted those prison chapters to be more impressionistic, more personal, more sort of, I wanted to be more inside my own head, my own experience in those Egypt chapters. Uh, those Egypt chapters. I'm not sure I got it quite right, but I think there was, I feel as though there's a sufficient difference for you to feel as you read the book that there are these two, these two parallel narratives, but 
that exist alongside one another, but each has their own human field. So the, the historic chapters are quite distant. They're very the third person and their past tense, etc. And then the, the Egypt in the prison is, is quite close, it's much closer. Do you want to read that little bit from um, um, page 64, the Torah and the Orient Prison intro? And this is just to show um, the language, how it's much more showing rather than telling, just writing for the census, etc. when you're in the prison. It's late evening when my prison van pulls up at another imposing old colonial era door. I'm still struggling to make sense of the interrogation when I'm ordered into the dust outside a place I'm not expecting. It looks like a medieval portcullis with massive timbers reinforced with iron straps and studded with bolts. It's illuminated with spotlights, and in the sulphurous yellow light, I can see a date carved into the lintel, 1889. Welcome to our museum, says one of the guards. He yanks me out of the van and I stagger for balance with my hands cuffed as he shoves me through a small hatch in the outer door. I have no idea why I'm being moved to a new prison. Very little of what's been happening makes sense, and I doubt that even if the guards spoke English, they'd be able to give me any answers. In the corridor behind the hatch, I pass through a dusty old metal detector that screeches at my handcuffs and I'm ushered into a courtyard with perhaps a dozen guards standing idly in a semicircle, watching as I'm led to a table beneath a large fig tree. Strip, one of them demands. What? Strip, take off clothes, all. It is still cold, even with my fleece, but I have no choice. I remove my jacket, my short, my shoes and socks, my jeans. I hesitate at my underwear and one of the guards gestures that I've gone far enough. In the freezing cold, I'm feeling more exposed than I've ever been. I'm a prisoner in a place I do not understand, with a language I do not speak, and a system I do not know. And for the first time, I understand something deeply unsettling. I am utterly powerless. What happens from here is completely out of my hands. I don't know what's coming, where I'm going, or what will happen there. Nor do I have any say over, nor do I have a say over any of it. They had me my prison uniform, thin, rough cotton pajamas with Arabic script in shabby blue letters printed across the back of the shirt and down one leg of the pants. I find out later that it means accused prisoner. They shove my clothes, watch, wallet and hat into a plastic bag and gesture me forward. I'm shivering in the winter evening chill as much from nerves as from the cold. Thank you. I think that gives it a flavor of um that very strong presence that you've created, recreated, being in the prison. I think that's done really well in this book. Um, I just wanted to ask how you were able to, because clearly it's, it's, it is a very factual book. And um, how, did you, how did you manage keeping notes? I know at one point you talk about having to write on toilet paper and smuggling yeah. that to your family. And, and then at the end, you're talking about packing up your notebooks so the guards don't find them. How were you able to keep rec all these records? So the toilet paper was a big part of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get very personal here. Yeah. I, uh, so we already uh, made you talk about stripping. Right, so. Okay. <laughs> so, so the guards, we, we, we discovered um, the toilet paper was, was obviously we had toilet paper and we were able to get um, smuggled, smuggled in a pen. A couple of the other prisoners um, had, were able to smuggle stuff through and, and one of them slipped us a pen when we were asking them for, for, for um, something to write with. And so I'd write these, I'd write a lot of notes, sometimes in the form of letters to my family, just because I at least I had something to address. So and I wanted them to know what we were dealing with, but I also wanted to record and document a lot of it. And some of them, I didn't want them to actually read and hope they didn't read it and hope they did it. And of course they would, but I didn't write it because I wanted them necessarily to read it. I wasn't quite frank about what was going on. And I discovered that, I mean, the cards were reasonably okay. They were reasonably thorough with the pat down searches, but they were also a little bit squeamish about getting too personal. And I realized if, 
if I sort of rolled it up inside my underwear and just sort of slipped it inside my underwear, then you guys weren't going to get <laughs> too into or at least might think I was a little bit too excited to see my mother. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it felt like it wasn't going to be out of place there. Um, and the, the, the place where we would um, we were able to greet the family wasn't barred off. You were able to have a few brief moments of physical contact, a hug. In those moments, I was able to slip the, the notes through. It was risky, um, but I also felt really compelled, particularly as a journalist, to, to, to do that and get those notes out. In fact, some of those, those letters, uh, those notes, and I'm sitting at the Museum of Australian Democracy, there's an exhibition at the moment on, on, on press freedom. And, uh, they've put some of those letters on display. It's, uh, the <laughs> right. So if you go down to camera, go and have a look at the, um, at, uh, the old museum and, and you can go and have a look at it. But we also, as time went on, there was a lot of public pressure. Eventually, towards the end of um, prison, we were allowed to um, have, like they started a, a master's degree in um, in international relations with Griffith University um, agreed to, to work with. And as a part of that, I, I had some notebooks. Um, but the notebooks, again, I really felt compelled to write notes and, and record what was taking place. But I also knew that I had to write things that were quite sensitive. Um, nothing that I felt could get people into trouble except maybe myself. But I really didn't want them to see it. So I discovered the, the metal beds. Uh, it was still, still blows me away that it actually worked, but the beds had um, these metal frames, and the, 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 the top of, and the bottom of the press metal frames were these kind of U shaped or C shaped C section um, metal um, bars, if you like. And perfectly by coincidence, right behind the bed, I realized that the notebooks, these hard, um, the kind of the, um, you know, the standard, the, those hard notebooks, the problem, yeah. the, the, the Moskin notebooks, fitted perfectly inside the, the C section. Um, and so, unless you physically pull the bed out and physically look behind it, if you just kind of put your hand on it, you wouldn't have actually noticed any, any, any difference. And so, I managed to hide the notebooks in there, and, and uh, yeah. And were people yeah. smuggling the paper to you, the, the notebooks? The no, no, no. The, the notebooks were able to get really out to as a part of that, as a part of the course. Um, I was able to have writing material. Oh, okay. And did you have that? Just occurred to me when you were talking. Did you have internet connection with Griffiths? Or no. It was done. It was done the old-fashioned way, um, where I would write. So they sent me all of the readings and, and all of the all of the PDF files and all of the uh, course notes and all of the lectures, the lecture notes, um, the lecture slides in a, in a huge box of material, big pa big package of material. And so I was supposed to go through it sequentially, and I was supposed to give these essays and assignments to the um, Australian. Australian embassy staff on their consular visits, which would happen every couple of weeks. And I remember one, and, and then they would take it away and they'd get feedback and they'd bring the feedback to the next the next visit and they'd respond to the feedback. And so it was a very slow, painfully slow process, but we're able to go through the course that way. Except once I, I went I did something really stupid. I was really struggling with one particular essay. And I wrote it, not feeling really happy with it, but I gave it to the embassy staff and they took it away and sent it off. And a few days later, I realized, shit, this is what I should have done. And so I had another crack at it. So that when they came back with the notes, I sent them out the updated version. And we kind of got out of sync and everything got, got really messy and confusing. Um, in the end, we sorted it out, but um, I realized that we've sort of got to work through that, that dialogue. <laughs> But yes, it was it was a slow and slower process. We didn't have access to any any internet at all. Yeah. And it's just interesting to hear the practicalities of how you survived there. Um, you know, it's quite an interesting story. 
Um, what was the worst day in prison for you? Um, it's hard to go past the day we were convicted. Um, we, we always felt, in fact, it's a really interesting thing. We always felt that we were going to get out of this. We always had hope. One of the things that people I'm often asked, people often say, is that we must have had hope. And in the end, I came to regard hope as quite toxic. And, and that moment of, that we were convicted was a moment I realised that actually hope was was the was the wrong strategy. Because when we were arrested, I hoped it would be over fairly quickly. I hoped that it would you know, that look at the evidence and that's out. Oh, this, this is a bit ridiculous. Don't worry, it's okay, or we'll take you to the airport and kick you out, and that'll be it. When the interrogation started, I hoped the prosecutor would see just how ridiculous this was. It didn't happen. When the trial started, we hoped the judge would chuck the whole thing out. A waste of time. That didn't happen. When we got to the end of the trial, we hoped it would be an acquittal. And when that didn't happen, it became that constant dashing of hope became really, really corrosive. And I realized that, in fact, what hope, hope is, hope, hope is the cross your fingers strategy. Hope is disempowering because it invests the agency in somebody else. Hope emphasizes the gap between where you are and where you want to be. And so I realized there's a wonderful Buddhist um, nun called Pema Chodron who once wrote, that we should abandon hope. And I realize that that's actually the, the smartest thing to do. That that's not to say that that's capitulation. That's about recognizing the reality of where you are and dealing with what's in front of you, rather than having some kind of idealized fantasy about where you want to be and, and not knowing quite how you're going to attain that, that, that ultimate goal. And so the day that we were convicted, it felt <coughs> like I'd been king hit by Mike Tyson and I could literally barely breathe. Was a, that was a very, very bad day. And you used the Pashna meditation, didn't you, to get through some of the worst of it? Yeah. yeah. That was, you know, in a lot of cases, in a lot of ways, I think I was just lucky. Um, and this is part of that. You know, the Pashna, um, I had a, a bad I had a breakup, a bad relationship breakup a few years previously. And to try and steady the ship, I went and did a Vipassana course. And, I don't know how many of you know of it or have heard about it, but it's it's a hardcore meditation course, 10, day, 10 days of silence. There's no writing material, no reading material, no contact with anybody else, not even eye contact with others. It's a fairly serious undertaking. And when they put me in, in solitary, I realized that actually I've been here before, I, I've got the tools for this. That doesn't mean it was easy. But at least I had had a had a had a kind of mechanism, had a um, a set of strategies, a set of, of um, structure, a structured way of sitting and thinking and, and processing what was what was taking place. And and not to underestimate how dangerous this environment is, and some of and the historical chapters do create a fairly vivid image of just what a dangerous job you have been part of. Do you want to read a bit about Kate? Is that right? Just to set this, put this in context, um, I had been, I was in, um, I was in, when I was in East Africa, one of the biggest stories, one of the stories that had been undercovered in, in a lot of ways, I think, mirrored Afghanistan was Somalia. Where, like Afghanistan, you had um, a government that was overthrown by Islamist warlords, the clan warlords, and that there was a civil war that was taking place in, in, in the country between these rival militias. And at the time that Kate and I went to Mogadishu, the situation stabilized to the point where the government in exile that had been based in Nairobi had decided it was going to come back into Somalia to try and re-establish control from actually within the country. Um, and we went around the time of a group of uh, parliamentarians, 
that had gone into in there to try and work out the logistics of settling in. So the place was still was quite dangerous. We knew it was dangerous, but as I said, the context was that it was stable enough for people to to, to start to for the government to start to reassert control. And Kate was your Kate was my producer. Um, I, Kate was based in Johannesburg, and worked together from time to time. She'd come up from Johannesburg to work with me on these stories. Um, so, we'll have to start from okay. here. Yeah, so, the next page. Um, again, just to very quickly to talk about. Okay, yeah. Um, we'd, one of the stories we're going to do, this is on the day that we arrived. Um, one of the stories I wanted to do was about, um, but we were hoping to do a couple of stories that afternoon. The stories didn't work out. And so we went to a hotel where the government delegation had been staying, hoping to find someone to speak to. We were on the inside for a short time, 15 minutes at the most, before we realized that anybody who had anything useful to say had already gone. We decided to move on. As we walked out of the hotel into the muggy tropical afternoon heat, Kate adjusted her headscarf to cover her blonde hair and walked to the side of the car facing the street while I stood by the curb. I called for our driver and our guards rattled their Kalashnikovs as they moved their technical and began climbing aboard. Without warning, without commotion, I heard the single sharp crack of a gunshot echo up and down the street. I ducked down behind a vehicle, unsure of where the sound had come from, there were a few seconds of silence while everybody tried to work out what had happened. And then the street erupted with, gun with engine noises and the guttural staccato of Somali shouting, but no more shooting. I stood cautiously to see Kate slumped across the back of the car, groaning softly. I thought she'd been frightened by the commotion and went round to comfort her. She put her head on my chest and I patted her back in reassurance. When I lifted my hand, I saw a crimson smear across my palm and the stain spreading slowly down Kate's white shirt. She'd been hit in a drive-by, but there was no time to ask who was responsible or why. Kate needed medical attention, and we all needed to get somewhere safe. I pushed her onto the back seat while the driver and the juice climbed into the front. I grabbed a plastic bag from my kit and clamped it over the wound, trying to keep air from getting into her chest cavity and blood from getting out. We sprinted through the broken streets, swerving like a dodging car through the traffic to the Medina Hospital run by the Red Cross, while I tried to hold Kate steady and the wound sealed. The Medina was the best of a dismal collection of medical facilities in Mogadishu. With no reliable power, it fired up its generator only when it needed lights for surgery. Its stores of drugs and dressings were acutely low, and it had no reserves of blood for transfusions. What it lacked in facilities, though, it made up for an experience. Nobody in the world knows as much about treating gunshot wounds as these surgeons, I told Kate, who was still conscious as we wheeled her into the operating theatre with its chipped walls and stench of fresh blood. She nodded weakly as I told her of a friend who had got a gut full of shrapnel and carbon and how the local doctors had operated before we got him evacuated. He had to have follow-up operations in France, but the surgeon said the Afghan doctors did some of the best work they'd ever seen. I'm pretty sure these guys will have just as much experience, I said gently. I know what they're doing. Kate nodded again as the anaesthetist ingested, injected drugs to knock her out. I'm scared, she said in a hoarse whisper. Don't worry, I replied, trying to convince myself as much as her. I'll be here when you wake up. Kate survived the operation but never worked from the anaesthetic. She died in the recovery ward. Yeah, I mean, I felt, I struggled about whether to include that story, but I still felt that it was essential to place that whole narrative in context. And what, what that chapter goes on to do is describe, in fact, I only learned this when I was researching that chapter, was that we, we still don't know, we think we know who fired the bullet. Um, it's not entirely clear why, but I'm pretty sure that it was because there was one particular warlord who had, interviewed, who had been interviewed by another female journalist and a photographer a few days 
prior to our arrival. And as far as we can tell, it issued some kind of hit against a white journalist and a, a couple of white journalists, a female and a male photographer. And so I'm fairly sure, as I said, it's only circumstantial, but she was, that was why she was, she was hit. Just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yes. Um, the book, the tone of the book is actually lighthearted. It's not a, but I think it is important for people to realise just, just what you've been doing. Did you have to, did you have to change some of the information to protect people in the book or to protect some of your Egyptian colleagues or? No, no, I didn't. Um, I didn't put anything in there that might, that might, I don't think I really did any serious editing. I mean, there's always selections, there's always a selection process that you go through in trying to decide what information to put in and what not to put in. Um, rather than changing anything, because I still felt, I mean, still is, this is still a work of journalism. Um, Literary journalism. <laughs> and I'm really, I'm, I'm flattered. I've, I've, I mean, Willow and I spoke about this when we were having a conversation. I, I still, <laughs> we did discuss this. I'm really pleased I tried to produce something. I happen to live with an extraordinary writer, Christine Jackman, who was, um, you know, who's written a fantastic book called Turning Down the Noise. And she's, she's a beautiful writer. We happen to have a very extraordinary community of writers in Brisbane. There's a very strong local community of some fantastic writers out there. And we, and so I'm very conscious of my shortcomings as a writer. Um, and I told him not to apologise through this whole well, time. I'm just saying that that, that I, I, it's what I tried to do and I'm really pleased and flattered that, that you see This is a good moment to say that it's being made into a film. Yes, it, well, that we're trying to make it into a film. Oh, there is there's a, there's a production company um, called Pop Family Entertainment, which has bought the option. They've had it for years. I've never really, I didn't really think that it, it would go anywhere, but we've, we've, they've got a script that's been written by Peter Duncan, who wrote um, Lake, the best known series. He was written, he wrote um, the, um, that recent series about um, Maralinda. Oh. Yeah, um, yes. Anyway, he's he's done quite a lot of he's done quite a lot of films. They've also recently hired also a director, um, Chris Stenders, who directed Red Dog, in the most recent Vietnam movie that I think is on Netflix. I think. Um, Chris is also uh, Chris also happens to be that film. My father is is that film. Chris's father Andy knew my dad very well. And in fact, I remember. A couple of days after I heard that Criv had been asked, had been invited to take part in the project and accepted, I got this email from Dad saying, Oh, I've just bumped into my old friend Andy Stenders, who knows whose son is involved in the media industry. You might like to contact him because he might be able to help you get some, do some, some projects. Don't worry, Dad, we're on it. Um, and what we don't have, and so we've got, they're trying to uh, find the lead and the finance for it. It's gone much further than I ever thought it would. Um, they now, you know, um, uh, Peter Duncan and I had dinner with a few about a week or so ago. Um, reckons that it's now he reckon he'd give it about an eighty percent chance of being. Oh, right. we, we need to find a lead. Um, they're looking at, at the moment um, at um, Simon Baker. Um, he's going to have to buff up a bit. <laughs> <It's> incredible. <laughs> um, that's great. That's I, great. Simon is apparently interested. He's busy, he hasn't read the script, but he's interested. He's, been, he's heard about the idea. And, you know, he likes the idea. So. Uh, and just, be, just a little bit more, and then we'll go to questions. So um, you had a moment where you read the work of the Austrian psychiatrist, Victor Frankl, that changed really sort of didn't it lead to the writing of this and where and your trajectory at the moment on, of, um, on press freedom campaign. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And do you guys know who Frankel was? 
a few nods. Now, Frankel, for those of you who don't know, uh, was he was a survivor of, of, of um, the German concentration camps, three of them. And he wrote Man's Search for Meaning, which I guess at first glance can seem a little bit like one of those sort of psych pop psychology and self-help books, but Man's Search for Meaning really is extraordinary. I thoroughly recommend it to anybody. It's a very short book, it's very easy read. Really. And it's Frankel's attempt to understand the difference between what, what it was that was the difference between those who survived and those who did not, if you factor out the obvious randomness of the camps. Um, and he said that it wasn't so much the physical strength of the individuals that made it through, so much as the reason that people felt they had to keep going. And he quoted Nietzsche in, in, in the book. He said, he who has a why can bear any how. And for me, I didn't realize it until quite late when I actually read the book. In the prison. You in prison. I read it in prison. It was one of the books that was brought into me in prison when we finally allowed books. And I realized that my why, quite unconsciously, had become that fight for press freedom. What we'd done, when I, it was one of the things that Allah had really helped me understand. This wasn't personal, that it wasn't about anything we'd done. That this was an attack on press freedom, that the government was trying to send a message to journalists, both locals and foreigners, that you will not speak to the opposition, you won't talk to the Muslim Brotherhood. They came after us because we were politically convenient, but that was still the fundamental reason why they are done this. And that's when we decided to, I decided to write some letters and smuggle them in the prison, declaring it to be an attack on the press freedom, not about anything that we'd done, but about what we represented. You'd in fact only been in the country a week. Yeah, yes, I'd only been in about a week. And I didn't really know. It couldn't have been. It was two weeks, I think. But it, well, it couldn't have been anything we'd, we'd done specifically. We'd been playing very, very safe battle. Very, I don't think, in fact, I'm most embarrassed. I've done what I think is some good journalism and I'm pissed off with the authorities of quite a few um, autocratic regimes and expected some kind of backlash. This wasn't one of those places and they kind of wish they'd come after me for better journalism. <laughs> 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 something a little bit more serious, but more hardcore. Um, but, but in the act of writing those letters, and I know those letters became they became really key because they, they framed the whole campaign, not just for us, but also for our colleagues outside of prison and for my family as well. And so it was when I read Frankel, I realized that that had become my why. It wasn't about me personally, but it was about what we represented. And we had to fight for this, not just for our own selves, but for everybody else that depended on on what we produced and for other journalists that needed that, that space to operate. And so that was in a way that I didn't really anticipate. We created that psychological framework, and that scaffolding that helped us get through, or helped me get through. And now you're particularly concerned because Australia is raising the most secretive Western nation with our recent legislation. Yes. This was the, the subject of the, the lecture from last night. I'm, and I'm, I'm kind of careful because I know that sometimes people might think that I'm sort of a bit tinfoil hatted about this, but when you look at the legislation, you realize the Egyptian government had passed loosely framed national security legislation, which on paper looked perfectly reasonable, but the definitions around it were so loosely framed, as I said earlier, that they could effectively use it to come after uncomfortable journalism. And if you think about the political imperatives that really flowed on from 9-11, I mean, security became the overriding narrative, the political narrative of the past couple of decades. It became, it was as much a part of Australia's own political narrative as it was a part of Egypt's. And the political imperatives that drove Egypt to do that were the same political imperatives that drove the Australian government to pass more national security legislation than any other government on earth, not just Western democracies, but any other government on earth. Before 9 
we had precisely one statute in all of the state and the Commonwealth books that mentioned terrorism, and that was one law in the Northern Territory. 9-11 until the present, government has passed 92 separate pieces of legislation. 92. So much so that a guy called Ken Roach, a Canadian researcher, described it as hyper-legislation. And that was back in 2012 when we passed only 50. Now, I realise if you think about what happened in 2019 when the AFP raided the ABC and News Corp journalists, um, that was using loosely framed national security legislation that was used to go after stories that were frankly politically embarrassing. Nobody has suggested that any of the stories exposed anything that genuinely undermined security. It's just that were politically embarrassing. So I realized then that this what's happening in Australia really is a part of this, this overall narrative. I'm not suggesting Australia is about to become Egypt anytime soon. But we are moving along that, nudging ourselves down that authoritarian line because we don't really have serious focused conversations in this country around what it is that we're trading off when we give the government all of these powers. Believe me, they've got extraordinary powers. Now, the fact that we're not seeing journalists being dragged off in manacles is as much a political choice as anything else. But we know from the research that my colleagues have been doing in Queensland that the law is working the way that it's supposed to. It's having a deterrent effect. The news organisations are saying, you know what? Better that we not touch this stuff because even though we'd probably win it, win a court battle, we just can't afford it. Sources are saying, looking to the experience of the people like Bernard Caleri and, and um, Witness K and, and David McBride and others, the whistleblowers who've gone through absolute hell in exposing the stories that they've been behind and say, that looks like a great idea. I, I want to go, I want to follow that guy's footsteps. Nobody's doing that. And so we know it's having a chilling effect. And so it's trying to say to people that, yes, my experience was extreme, but it's part of the continent that Australia is on. We need to pay attention. Yeah, it's okay when you've got a benign government, but if you don't, the yes, tools are there. The tools are there, and we know that if the tools are there, then at some point they will be used. Yeah. That seems like a good point to perhaps open up to. I can't tell what the time is on my clock, but um, I think that's time to open up for questions. Is that okay with you? Yeah. And look, I'll just say to our colleagues on Zoom, um, you're welcome to put up a hand or um, ask any question in chat, which I'll keep an eye on for, for Willa and Peter. Jane. Oh, no, okay. please, please. It's a, this is a group. <laughs> My question is about um, journalism and media industry uh, and whether you see, for example, a rise in freelancing and people cobbling together bits of different jobs, exposing journalists in, to additional risk because they have a different kind of status. Um, and sometimes I know in Mexico, for example, one of the most dangerous places to be a journalist, um, that it's even denied that they were a journalist when they're killed and things like that. If, that. if that kind of change to the industry and people's association with their outlets is placing people at further risk. Yeah, and that, those risks are multitude. They work in multitude in a number of ways. First of all, you're right, that, that there is a much, much greater rise of freelancers. And that means, particularly with foreign news, um, it happens domestically as well, but often with, what happens with foreign news is, is that editors will say, well, you go off, you know, we're interested in principle, but you go off and see what you come back with, and then we'll have a look at it, and if we like it, then we'll run it, which means that in the production of the story, the journalist carries all of the risk. Um, when I went, when I went to, I went back, well, when I went to Somalia in the first place with Kate, um, I was, contemplated doing that, but realised it wasn't really the smart way of operating. And I went back, when I went back 
a few years later, again, I was struggling to find anybody who'd pay. I wanted to make a film as a kind of tribute to, to what, to Kate's legacy, um, following up on, on that trip. I felt quite bloody minded, basically saying, damn it, we're going to finish the job that we went to start. We might, no one's going to stop us from doing this. Um, and I contemplated doing it myself until I realized again that very problem it was just pointless unless I could probably, if, if something went wrong, then I was going to find myself, and there was no one to bail me out. So, but I'm, I made that choice, but I was lucky because I had the BBC to go to, and you eventually found, I found someone, an editor who was willing to back, this, back that trip. But that was, that's unusual. More and more, in foreign news journalists are carrying the risk. Domestically, um, it's, there's, I think, well, one part of the problem is that we're, we're losing experienced journalists. The average age of most newsrooms has dropped enormously. Um, and that means that you just don't have the people who are either capable of, of carrying out these investigations in a way that will hold water. Um, or journalists that are capable of making judgments on that, how, about what, what the risk lies and how to get around them, how to minimise risk. Um, the risk appetite for newsrooms is, is reduced, so a lot of the stories are also just not being done. Um, I think overall, because of the digital disruption, we see the degrading of, of that overall capacity to, to do good investigative journalism. Um, I think we need to reconceive of how we pay and how we finance, how we operate, how we think about the media. There's a whole other world of, of conversation involved with that. But I think we're at a point now, like one of the projects, I think I mentioned this to Sumin, um, that I'm trying to start is with going off a bit of a tangent, but forgive me, this is one of those things please, that I um, the, the, the ANU, is the, the School of Cybernetics, um, so the, the school is run by Genevieve Bell, who's an extraordinary, extraordinary brain. Um, and the cybernetics comes from old computing uh, theory, in which they basically say that the, the, the most basic unit of analysis is the system that includes the technology, the software, the human interface, and the feedback loops. And that you can't reduce it any more than that because each of those things affect everything else. And I've approached them to say that I think we need to think about the media, and journalism in particular, as a cybernetic system, and think about how we would re-engineer, how we would redesign that system to actually give us the kind of outcome that we need. And that includes making sure that we've got the capacity to do good investigative journalism to produce content that is actually going to hold government to account and inform public to back and do all of those good things that journalism is supposed to do. So anyway, we're talking about that kind of project. It's not off the ground yet. That's what I'm hoping. That's what I think we need to take the discussion. Um, Peter, I was wondering about the title of the book. Was it always called the first casualty and did you sort of have a debate with yourself and with the publisher about the earlier Philip Knightley book um, which of course and then another Australian journalist of course who um, wrote a notable book with the same title but quite a different book yes. much more a sort of history of um, war reporting. It, it was and in fact we um, if it seems a nod to Knightley's book, then I'm, I'm very pleased that it would be that that really didn't factor into it. Um, it really, it was one of those things where, and the title was really one of those things that came right at the very end when the publisher was saying, what are you going to call this damn thing? <laughs> I, I, I had all sorts of ideas um, and none of them felt quite right until I thought, well, what about the first casualty? And I kind of knew it had been out there, and I said, look, it feels right to me. And he said, he looked at it and thought, well, Knightley's book is sufficiently far back in history for us to be able to use the title without getting into trouble, and there is that nod to what 
to, to that book as well. So there is a kind of literary, there is that connection to it, an acknowledgement, if you like, almost a tribute to it. But, but even so, it, it would still stand on its own. Does that make sense? No, with that, absolutely. And it, and it describes pretty much what the book is about yeah. anyway. And um, Mohammed Fahmy, who was um, one of your two other colleagues who was arrested and imprisoned, he went on to write, I think, about his experiences as well. And, and I wondered if you two talked about um, your experiences of writing these sort of memoirs. So, Fanny, Fanny's an interesting character. Um, the short answer is no, we didn't. I knew he'd written the book. Um, we'd been communicating for a while, but a lot of people think that Fanny, that we ought to be very close. And you can't go through this kind of experience without bonding with the, the cellmates that you're there. And, and I remember Fanny at one point saying, you know, this has made us like brothers. We've got this really powerful and intimate experience. We know each other incredibly well. And do we do? That's made us like brothers. I said to him, yes, you're right. That's true, it has. But I said, you know what they say? You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. <laughs> um, just because we're there doesn't mean that we get along. And I, and, and I think... That's really clear. Luke and I want to throw uh, so we can talk much about that. Right, definitely my voice will come out just quickly. Sorry. Um, I've got a, a factual question and maybe a, a bit more of a personal one. Um, I remember I just moved from South Africa to Australia when I was watching the trial unfold on Al Jazeera. And I'm just trying to remember your two um, colleagues were pardoned, but did you, you were you, you weren't pardoned, so... I'm still a convicted terrorist. Oh, aren't you? So, I still have an outstanding prison sentence to serve. Does that mean that you can't travel? It, well, it, it, every time I go overseas, my lawyer breaks out into a cold sweat. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are, so my lawyers have drafted um, a table, a red, orange and green table. Like the COVID. Yeah, the, the green countries are those that have no, no extradition treaty with Egypt that isn't a problem. And the reds are those countries that very clearly are problematic, the, the kind of close neighbours of Egypt. And the oranges are those countries that have treaties but are kind of problem that may not go through it. So in the case of South Africa, there's, there's one extradition treaty that covers the whole of the AU, the African Union. So that falls in the yellow list because even though that extradition treaty exists, we don't think they'd be inclined to go through the headache of, of actually extraditing me to Egypt. The problem is that if I did my job and got up the government's nose, then you could easily see some government officials say, no, oh, we have here, Mr. Peter, nothing to do with you, nothing personal, of course, we believe in press freedom, but we have certain treaty obligations out of our hands is between you and the Egyptian authorities. We have to we have certain obligations ourselves. You know? um, and even if that's very low probability, the risks of it are quite high. And so that some part of countries I can't go to. And of course, it's also a huge pain in the ass. So I don't know how many of you know when you go to the US, you have the visa waiver form that you have to fill in. It asks, have you ever been convicted of any criminal offence? <laughs> Hands up who's tried to get into the US with a terrorism conviction. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. 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 It's Yeah, that was the other, I'm you know, just thinking of a country like South Africa, which has got the most amazing constitution in the world. But press freedom is very fragile there because that whole invoking of national security I was there last year and it was, you know, there were a lot of riots and the government invoked the National Security Act and the, we know that the press is, is held hostage there. Yeah. So they capture to, um, and so thinking of your why, don't you ever get tired of it? Don't you ever think? I, I do. I do sometimes get tired. I do sometimes feel exhausted by it. But and I guess one of the things that I um, 
I don't want to always be defined by an agent. Um, you know, I, as well, I mentioned in the introduction, I had a 30 year career as a journalist. And, you know, I feel like I've done some things I'm very proud of. Um, but it's always going to be Egypt that everyone knows me by. In a way, even though Egypt has become a platform that this press freedom thing has been built on, I kind of feel that that's a way of moving the story forward to, from a personal perspective. But I also feel as though I owe a debt of gratitude to my colleagues who really, really fought hard for me and my two inmates are in prison. The campaign, the, the, the Free and AJ staff campaign, got enormous traction. Those letters I've smuggled out of prison made it onto Barack Obama's desk. And that was only because both of those things were only true because my colleagues gave a shit. They really joined the fight. They saw and understood that this was something important that they had to get involved with. They didn't have to do that, but they did. I would still be in prison if it weren't for that campaign that policy. And so it's not that I constantly think about it. I kind of feel as though, okay, this is, I, I, I've got recognition. I've got a voice that this thing has given me. And I feel like it's, you know, I've, I'd be abrogating a responsibility if I if I kind of walked away from it. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm going to cough, but it does. Thank you. Let's be. Um, I know. I in Helen's interview with you, you mentioned this, and it struck me very strongly then, as it does now. How hard it must be for you to have not be able to pursue that career that has been such a the transition. Must be yeah. In fact, my partner Christine sometimes says that the greater woman has been having to give up that sense of identity as purpose. Do you think Egypt will ever lift? Give you a pardon? It, it would have to take a change of government, and I'm not talking about another election. We would have to see a, a huge. It would need another coup of some sort. And even then, it's, it's not particularly likely. There's just no political imperative for it now. It's going to have to be the You need to go, it's quite so negative. <laughs> <laughs> Is there another question? Yep. No, you're you first. Okay. <laughs> first of all, I just wanted to say it makes me incredibly proud to have you as a colleague and being here in the room with you. Um, my question is around relationships. What is your relationship now with authorities and Egypt and the Egyptian people? How do you feel about? Um, okay, so relationship requires two people. Um, I don't have much of a relationship with the Egyptian authorities. I haven't really had anything to do with them since I left. Um, as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware, as far as I'm concerned, I, mean, I have to treat them as if they, they want me back in prison. I have to make that assumption. But from a personal perspective. I have some of the most extraordinary people I met were Egyptians. Um, I remember when we were convicted, some of our own guards were in tears. Um, you know, I remember some of my, I mean, Alad is one of the most amazing characters I've, I've ever come across. Seriously, one of the most brilliant minds, the most brilliant political, political minds I've ever encountered. Um, the, activists that I met in prison. When, when we were there, the first, I was in um, two police cells and three prisons. The first prison contained almost all of the leadership of the original January 11th, January 26th uh, revolution of 2011. All of, there were civil, there were youth activists, there were trade unionists, there were um, opposition politicians who, really inspiring figures, courageous, thoughtful, intelligent, wonderful, generous people. When I walked into the prison on the first day, I still remember this. They, it, was, it was quite late night after that strip search. 
um, they just started shoving food and clothing out through the bars themselves. And for me, you know, I know that all of that stuff was incredibly precious, and yet they were just kind of shoving whatever they whatever they could through the bars themselves. The reason I'm saying it is because that I, I I love them for it. I really do. My my dispute, my argument is not with Egypt or Egyptians as a people. It's with those fuckers who, within the regime and, and within the interior ministry in particular, who were running that corrupt judicial system in prison. I can ask a question. So you partially probably answered that question, and it links to lots of questions that we've heard. Just I'm curious from your personal perspective. So you're convicted, obviously, hoping isn't working as much and you do have support of your colleagues and stuff but do you did you really feel adequately supported by the government and by a network or like at that stage where the hope is not obviously working you're convicted so what was going through your head so adequately supported um i so i knew about the campaign I didn't know anywhere, I had no idea of the extent of the campaign. Um, but I knew it was, I knew it was taking place. I, I, I knew that my colleagues were involved. I, I many of my brothers said to me that you don't really understand how big this has become. And I kind of, internally I'd roll my eyes and say, yeah, whatever, you know, this is the pot in which I swim, of course I get it. I really didn't have the faintest clue of just how, how big it was. There were times when we really felt alone and isolated. Um, but I don't, I think the government did a pretty good job. DFAT and the, the, the consular staff in particular did a, did a pretty good job. But um, I think that was also because they had the political. Um, the campaign gave the minister and the department the political clout that they needed to actually prioritise our case. Um, it was Julie Bishop. That was Julie Bishop, yes. And honestly, I, I don't, I, I, I suspect, I'd, again, I'd still be there if, if, it, if I was on if um, Maurice Payne was, was, was foreign minister. What are we doing? Uh, I think she was, she was useless. Um, so, but, I, but as I said, I think that was largely, I mean, Penny Wong, sorry, um, Julie Bishop was a good foreign minister and the department under her operated, I think, very well. But I'm also under no illusion that a big part of the reason that it did work was because there was a political, there was enough political momentum to, to make our, to keep our case. Our case was on the news every other week. She was under a lot of pressure, but that was positive pressure. And your parents' charm offensive oh, as well. Totally. Right. We all fell in love with you. Yeah, I, I realised, if the truth be known, it, it was Australia fell in love with my mum and dad. I was this kind of abstract notion, this, this sort of like, you behind. Seriously, I, I know that, you know. You know but, uh, the first question I'm asked by most people is, oh, I'm so sorry to hear what you've been through, but how's your mum and dad? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Just coming from Thailand, and you know this context a little bit from the, the event that we had before, um, I always look at um, Australian um, free, uh, freedom of speech highly, like you got a lot of people there, and it is always controversial in Thailand when the journalists, how, how far they can go. Like first, it's personally, it can be uh dangerous to themselves as government doesn't support that and secondly it's sometimes it's clouded by the words national interest national security so the balance there is quite difficult to to to, to, to gauge so but when i had to do the event last time and i have to deal with the university media team and they told me kind of like do a self self-censorship in a way like can't 
broadcast everything and it kind of brought me into the a journalist shoes like how far i can go with this so because thinking about the university interest you don't want to upset thai government you want students to come in that sense or but but then the, on the other hand i feel like i have to be a voice of those who i want to like that to be an advocate that kind of balance how do you take that Sure, and I wish there was an easier answer to the answer to it. There, there, there simply isn't. I mean, um, you know, I've, I've always interpreted the role that we play quite aggressively. Um, the, the public interest or the national interest isn't necessarily the same as the government's interest. Um, there's, um, there will always be a degree of I think self self censorship. That word censorship is so loaded. Whenever you do a story, and it doesn't matter what that story is or who you are, you're always making judgments about what to put in and what to put out, how to define a story. And sometimes that's based on very pragmatic grounds around what you can get away with, what you can what you can say, what you can't say. And, and that's always going to vary in the political context that you're operating in. And, and you know, again, I'm not saying in, in interpreting, being quite aggressive about my interpretation of, of public interest. Um, that doesn't mean that I've, I've been, well, I've been very lucky because I've been, in most cases, a foreigner. And, and, in most cases, the risk, the risks that I've taken have been much less than the risks that a local would take if they're doing the same sort of story. Um, and so I completely understand that context. Everyone will draw the line in a, in a way in which they feel comfortable with. What I'm trying to say is that I understand you know, there's no there's no easy way of saying that, that this is this is the correct way of making that judgment this is the wrong way um, and I'm also saying that those judgments are constantly being made even if they're unconscious judgments um, it's just a question of, of assessing why you're doing a particular thing and whether the risk or the consequence is worth the story or the issue that you're trying to raise and sometimes those risks are there are higher risks that are worth taking just because these stories are more serious. And sometimes it's just, it's just not worth pissing them off because you know that the issue just isn't that big a deal. You know, It's very easy to upset the Thai authorities by making some flippant remark about, about the royal family. You know? um, and there's no point doing that if, it is not, if it's not necessary. But if you have a story about some serious level of corruption within the royal family, then it is absolutely worth doing because that is an issue that is important for the public. You know, there's no case by case. It is a case by case study, and it's a question of how far you're prepared to go as an individual. And if you've got a family and kids and so on, you're also exposed, and that's much harder judgment to take than if you're a single journalist who's capable of moving and fleeing, you know, leaving the country if things get too bad, or if you're a foreigner. Can I just ask another question about, um, from a publishing point of view, um, and the whole genre of literary journalism? Um, I'm not sure if you know Andrew Harding's um, book, These Are Not Gentle People. Um, that is a similar kind of genre, and I was recommended that book by somebody, and I, I heard it as an audio book at first, and I, I couldn't get through the first two chapters. And then when I heard it serialized as a podcast on the BBC, I couldn't not listen to it. It was brilliant. And I think the difference there was that you had you had Andrew Harding's voice and you had extracts from the trial. And it was, you know, and so the mode through which something is published is so important. And I wonder how much control you have over that and whether this will be an audio book with some <laughs> American actor reading. <laughs> 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 All right, okay. I listen to it rather than us. Look, I have to I have confess this to you yet, yeah. but it's just been a really busy period lately. And I 
tried reading it in my last 10 minutes before bed yeah. and I just couldn't. And so I listened to the audio book. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. And it was so nice having Peter's voice. I feel like I know you far better than you know me. Like I, it was such an intimate way of becoming acquainted with Peter's story. It was really wonderful. Um, but Peter found it a very hard job to do, I have to say. Yeah. And, and I know Andrew very well. All right. I worked with him a lot. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. He's a good friend of mine. Wow. Yeah. Um, and Andrew is one of the best broadcasters that I know. And that might also explain why podcast is much better than, than an audio book. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Did Andrew read the audio book or was it done by an actor? No, that was the thing. That was what was so frustrating. There was this, that was a British uh, voice, but it just wasn't him and it didn't work. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Was this works beautifully. This works yeah. really, really well. Yeah. And you know, you can listen to it while you're driving and washing up. And that's doing reading. Work. These days, that's reading. I think I also fall asleep if I try and read. Yeah, I'll, I'll listen to it on. So I recommend it. Yeah. The audio version. I think, you know, it's, if I was right, if I, if I was, if I was doing, if I'd written a piece of fiction or if I'd written some other book, I'm not sure that it would work well. I think, I, I discussed this with Will, and I think being, being a first person narrative makes it more appropriate, but it would feel odd, as you said, for, for someone else to be using um, first person singular. And there was also a lot of dialogue that this British, mm -hmm. this British um, voice was, you know, talking about South African, you know, it, it just didn't work. Yes. Oh, very off putting. It's, um, <laughs> Wolfen and our audio um, expert has said audio books for the win. <laughs> um, Peter, thanks very much for that. I have a, um, I, I'm interested in your whether you've reflected on the parallels between your situation and Chengwei in China right now. And you talked about the groundswell of support, you know, other sort of, okay, you had abandoned hope, but you know, he did let you know that, that you had so much support um, out here, you know, in Australia, globally. It's not quite the same, is it? No. And no. all your reflections on that? Yeah, I, I, in fact, I'm glad you asked about it. I mean, I, I, I don't know Chen Lei, but I know, but I've been very closely involved with, with her campaign and the partner in particular. Um, who has been, been speaking to um, about her case and I've written a few letters and spoken a few times about it. Um, the problem, one of the issues is, uh, you're right, she, she hasn't, her campaign hasn't had anywhere near the level of attention. But for that to happen, you need a couple of things um, that worked very much in my favor. First of all, you need something to keep the story alive. And because they've, because the Chinese authorities have kept everything out of the public eye, there's only been a few very rare moments when the story has developed to the point where there is something for the news organisations to, to actually latch on to. The other thing you need is a champion who is capable of representing you in your own in, outside of prison. And as we've already mentioned, my parents were extraordinary at that. Um, Cheng, Lei, Cheng Lei's family just aren't, um, just aren't there. They're not capable of doing it. They're not in that kind of position to, to talk up about that. Nick Coyle, the partner, is, but Nick is also under fairly strong advice from DFAT as well to limit what he says. Um, and so in the absence of a really strong champion and advocate for you who's, who's capable of and, be, and prepared to be in the media spotlight all the time and any kind of rolling story the egyptians gave us a gift because you know every trial hearing that that allowed the cameras in and they stretched that out over the period of six or eight months you know, this thing that just sort of as someone said to me a while back after I got out because I was concerned that people, I was not concerned, but I was wondering how long our story would remain in public consciousness. And he said that the story had been laid down in sedimentary layers because, because 
every time there was a new hearing, you know, the cameras would go in and the family would show up. And, you know, it would be, there was always some way of keeping the story alive. The Chiang Mai hasn't happened. And that's one of the main reasons why it just, it's just, the case has disappeared from, from public view. We need to be very active about this. We need to be talking a lot more about it. I think there's been a moment, the change of government, and there's a period when Penny Wong herself, I think, is, is much more actively engaged. I know she's more actively engaged. There's been murmurs, there's been signs, you know, the, the, the Beijing watches regularly, there's a, a window of opportunity. But the, you know, there's been the talk of a reset in relations, and, the, and I've said it publicly a few times that I think releasing Chiang Mai would be a very easy way for the Chinese government to signal a willingness to, to reset the relationship without actually giving up anything. It wouldn't mean giving up anything strategic or substantive, but it would be a gesture, a gesture of goodwill. I'm hoping that we'll see some development there, but it's a, it's a really tough, tough fight. No answer. Light question, last question. <laughs> so, uh, but we are part of Macau, of course, is languages. And you mentioned you didn't speak the language. Um, how did you handle that? Um, did you learn any Arabic or? I did. I'm a crap linguist. Um, I have to say this up front. Um, I've really, I always really struggle with languages. But one of the, one of the, one of the, um, my cellmates, um, a young guy called Shady, um, he he spoke rough English, rough English, and so we agreed um, that each day we'd spend an hour teaching. He'd teach me Arabic, and I'd spend an hour teaching him English. Um, so, for the first, let's go back to this whole question of hope. Um, I I never seriously believed I'd be in for very long, so I didn't really feel as though. Was worth putting energy into learning Arabic because I was only ever going to be in there for a few weeks. And it was only after we were convicted, sentenced to seven years, that I thought, shit, I really need to, I really need to read time <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was when I really started to put some serious work into, into Arabic. As it happened, I was only there for another month and a half, two months after that. And so None of it's really stuck, <laughs> but yes, yeah, I was, I did, I did, I did try. I was just wondering about the, how do you manage um, transiting a system oh, that you don't understand? I, there, were, uh, there was, there were people who, that, there were, yeah, there were tools, I mean, there were people who spoke enough English to help me understand. Um, there was a court appointed translator um, who was able to, to interpret the, the trial, at least for um, there was, you know, there was in the first the first police cell that I got tossed into this crazy, tiny space, um, sort of eight foot square concrete box, um, not much bigger than, than this, a bit bigger than the table, um, square. Um, and that was, yeah, that completely void of furniture, um, sticky squat toilet in one corner and a steel door and nothing else in there, a, a leaky tap and that was it. In that concrete box, there were 16 guys. <gasps> yeah, 16, and some of them had been in months. There was, in that box, there was one, one young student who spoke enough English for me to sort of be able to at least communicate and let me know what was going on and who was who in, the, in that box. And there was the luxury of being an English, native English speaker. You can always find someone who speaks English. It's rare that you can find an English speaking person who can speak another language. Right, look, thank you. I think we um, yeah. might. Time to finish. Close, but thank you both for a really wonderful conversation. It's mm -hmm. been a privilege to see you on this thank afternoon. You. Thank you, Peter. That was wonderful. Thank and you. I highly recommend the book.